So welcome to our opening panel of the summit on the topic of enabling global access to space through space sustainability. Our ability to continue to enjoy the societal benefits of space activities hinges on our ability to use the space environment sustainably. Yet, for global efforts in support of space sustainability to be effective, they must be relevant at the regional and national levels and consider the needs of a variety of actors. Newer space actors are seeking to access the benefits of space responsibly in an environment where many of the space sustainability frameworks and goals have already been established. And while global frameworks like the Sustainable Development Goals highlight the need for ensuring the benefits of space applications, and global agreements such as the guidelines on the long-term sustainability of space activities provide consensus, baseline sustainability, you know, space sustainability principles, there is nevertheless a need to focus on the implementation of pragmatic policies and practices that will ensure space sustainability. This panel will explore how progress on space sustainability can help to ensure global access to the benefits of space activities. We will focus on considerations for new space actors, particularly in the Asia-Pacific region. To discuss this topic, we have five distinguished panelists. We have Fukushima Yasuhito, who is a senior research fellow in the Policy Studies Department at the National Institute for Defense Studies here in Japan. We have Josef Kohler, who is the director of the European, uh, sorry, the <laughs> principal of space safety and sustainability at Project Piper Amazon. Uh, then seated next to him, Ludwig Wöhler, director of the European Space Policy Institute. And then um, Muriel Hu, senior project manager for space safety at the Luxembourg Space Agency. And uh, last but not least, Nagai Hiroaki, Group President of Space Engineering at uh, JSAT. So welcome to all of you, and thank you very much for joining our panel to share your insights with us. So I wanted to start the discussion of our topic with a couple of different national perspectives, uh, and beginning with a perspective from our host countries. So uh, Fukushima-san, if I could start with you, you've written about how the democratization of space has affected Japan's space ecosystem. What major changes have you noted in Japan's space activities, ranging from commercial space companies to university-led activities to domestic governance approaches? Well, uh, thank you for the introduction, Dr. Martinez. And also, I'd like to say thank you to uh, Ms. Azelton for organizing this panel. And also, I'd like to express my appreciation to the Secure World Foundation and also uh, Japan's National Space Policy Secretariat for giving me this opportunity. So to answer your question, uh, Japan's space ecosystem has changed a lot uh, in this 21st century uh, due to the uh, increasing democratization of space at home. And so actually now, uh, you know, uh, space, activ acti space activities by no state actors are more prominent, pro more prominent than ever. So entering the 21st century, uh, some Japanese universities started uh, the operation of really small satellites called CubeSats, that's uh, 10 centimeter square satellites. So to date, uh, around uh, 25 Japanese un universities uh, successfully operated such small satellites. So such efforts by universities ha has actually have actually contributed to the uh, cultivation of a specialized uh, domestic workforce and led to the creation of uh, many startups in Japan. So, according to the Space Tide, uh, there are more than 100 Japanese startups in the space business. And also, uh, you know, uh, legacy space companies and also uh, non traditional, I mean, non space enterprises are now. Uh, doing some uh, actually novel, non-traditional space activities and also collaborating with these startups. So, uh, in response to such a, uh, such a, a substantial change uh, of domestic space ecosystem, Japan has been updating its, uh, its domestic uh, space governance framework. 
So in 2016, uh, Japan passed the Space Activities Act and also the Remote Sensing Data Act. Uh, in addition to these uh, foundational uh, domestic laws, uh, in 2021, Japan passed the Space Resources Space Resources Act uh, to uh, to you know uh, to authorize the ownership of space resources. And in addition, uh, also in twenty in twenty twenty in twenty twenty one, the cabinet office issued a guideline a guidelines uh, for spacecraft uh, for a license to operate a spacecraft for uh, orbit servicing. And finally, I'd like to mention that now Tokyo is really stepping up its effort uh, to make sure that uh, commercial operators uh, can operate its satellites uh, safely and stably. So last year, the Ministry of Defense started uh, its operation of SSA system and started sharing its collected data with commercial satellite operators. And in addition, uh, so last year, the cabinet also created a council to promote information sharing between the public and private sectors to ensure the stable use of outer space. So thus, uh, well, now we are seeing, uh, you know, a lot of changes in the uh, uh, space ecosyst- ecosystem in Japan. And it is ex- expected that more changes will come in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for those very insightful remarks. So I'd like now to switch to a different national perspective from another region. So if I could switch to you, Muriel. Um, Luxembourg's national space strategy seeks to develop its space sector while also contributing to the sustainability on Earth and focusing on a responsible approach to space activities. So can you tell me more about how Luxembourg has evolved its approach to space activities and space governance? Absolutely. Thank you for the introduction and uh, thank you for the invitation. Um, Yes, I'd like to recap a little bit the the history of, of that Luxembourg has with space that goes back to 1985 with the creation of SCS. Back then, that was a startup uh, and has evolved to now a global uh, space operator. Uh, and that was 1985. Move forward to 2005, where Luxembourg joined uh, the European Space Agency as a member state. Uh, 2015, they set up the... Um, large space resource utilization, which was another big step and actually put Luxembourg at the forefront uh, for more innovative approaches and more innovative um, active space activities. Then in 2018, the creation of the Luxembourg Space Agency, another major just step. And in just a few years ago, 2022, our first uh, large strategy uh, for, for the following five years uh, that was focused on space sustainability. So from the start, really an important topic. We've declined it, as you said, uh, into uh, different pillars, being uh, sustainability space for sustainability on Earth, sustainability in space, sustainable use of space resources, going back to our um, law on space resources, which has always been a very, very focal point in Luxembourg. And then we have a more horizontal pillar, uh, that's economic sustainability, because we believe it's important if we want sustainability to have companies that are going to be sustainable. Uh, and we actually declined that in all three of our, our sustainability pillars. Um, continuing today, uh, Luxembourg is present in many different fora, being in the European, uh, at the European Space Agency, obviously, uh, at the European Union, and also in international fora such as uh, UN COPUS. We also uh, engage in many uh, international cooperation, having MOUs to stay in the region, uh, amongst others with Japan and, and Korea. Um, and then there's an ongoing support for our space ecosystem. We really try to focus on developing uh, space economics in Luxembourg, creating really a national ecosystem which now has almost 80 uh, companies uh, for, for a small country, country like Luxembourg, which is uh, quite remarkable. Uh, we also developed that on the academic side, um, focusing also on talent development uh, on, on space research. So with all these elements, Luxembourg is really putting itself at the forefront 
uh, of the space industry with a real will to be a global leader on that, um, amongst other main spacefaring nations, and to become really a hub in terms of space innovation. Thank you. Yeah, it's it's quite amazing to see the the, the breadth uh, and depth of what's have been happening in in Luxembourg over the last decade. So very very impressive. So I'd like to turn now to some industry perspectives. Um, if I may turn to you, Nagai-san, your company, Jvesat, is the largest satellite operator in the Asia-Pacific region. It also has a number of expanding areas, such as uh, new investor, uh, investment partners and spin-off companies. How do you ensure that your activities contribute to a sustainable space environment? Thank you. Uh, thank you for the, uh, introducing uh, the uh, question. Thank you. So, uh, first of all, uh, I would like to introduce myself. Uh, I'm Hiroaki Nagai, uh, group president uh, of uh, Space uh, Engineering Group from uh, Skapak JSAT. My background is uh, space uh, satellite operation oh, uh, that's uh, over 26 years. So, we, Skypark JSAT, has been operating uh, uh, 13 satellites in total uh, since 1989. Uh, as, um, all as a uh, geo satellite fleet in uh, you know, Pacific, Asia Pacific. A service provider of uh, uh, satellite communication to the government agency and uh, pro- a private company. We think the uh, stable and safety operation of the satellite is a significant factor for space environment. Uh, therefore, uh, we should plan to de- launch our own SSA, uh, Space uh, Situational Awareness Payload, we call the GSOM in Geo Orbit, to monitor our Geo Satellite Operation uh, status regulatory. Uh, in addition to that, we Skype at JSAT established a startup company called uh, Orbital Lasers. Uh, uh, in, in the last January in this year, uh, Orbital Lasers will focus on uh, space debris, living world, and also developing uh, its laser technologies. That uh, uh, Orbital Lasers present uh, is from uh, uh, satellite operation. So he uh, works for the satellite operation a uh, long time. Uh, his demand is uh, uh, remove uh, uh, debris in the geo site. So, um, by in incorporating a space-based LiDAR technology into satellite, the company aspires to the, uh, uh, become the world's first commercial provider on the high uh, precision ground surface information through the uh, uh, use of satellite LiDAR, light uh, detection and ranging. The issue of the space debris is now uh, regarded as an uh, environmental problem as significant as uh, uh, global warming and uh, marine plastic pollution. Uh, Skyfish just that we are and uh, orbital lasers are uh, honestly addressing this concern they are aiming to uh, contribute to improvement of the sustainable space environment. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for sharing with us the, the, the progress of, of your company. Of course, it's the uh, commercial sector will be a vital partner in addressing the debris remediation challenge. So staying with the the, the private sector, uh, Josef, if I could move to you as a, a new entrant uh, looking to operate large numbers of satellites, can you tell us how Amazon Kuiper has approached space sustainability in terms of system design, contribution to industry best practices, and regulatory outreach efforts? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Peter, for having me. Um, it's really nice to see so many colleagues and friends in the crowd, and I'm looking forward to having many productive discussions here, and I appreciate your question. Um, so Amazon a few years ago recognized that there are billions of people without uh, reliable internet service, and Amazon decided to invest into building a, uh, an infrastructure, a large-scale infrastructure to address that issue and um, develop a low Earth orbit uh, LEO constellation. Um, So we have um, 
also recognize that at the same time, when you invest such a large number into a Leo constellation, building a uh, infrastructure uh, and a global telecon, telecom, it, um, the sustainability has to be built in from the beginning. Um, and so Amazon started Project Kuiper uh, to build that Leo, uh, Leo satellite constellation with st sustainability built in and space safety built in from the get-go. And I'd be happy to talk more about the details um, that are involved in that. Um, we have launched uh, a few uh, last year, just recently, two proto-satellites uh, that have worked phenomenally well. And uh, we're now in the last phase of testing our uh, a, a very important sustainability part of that, which is the re-entry and disposal phase of that. Um, so to us, as I said, sustainability is, is very important. Otherwise, you cannot operate a large constellation. We are uh, focusing a lot on um, working with uh, the rest of the industry, with regulators on what are the industry best practices. We have uh, recently joined the Zero Debris Charter that's facilitated by ESA because we truly believe in it. And um, we're also working with other standards and best practices organization. We think that is uh, really important as we're going forward to maintain that, what Muriel said earlier about the economic stability, uh, sustainability, coupled together that with the uh, environmental and long-term sustainability of outer space. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. It's very interesting. I mean, the the advent of large constellations raises concerns about space sustainability, but also provides the, the driver and market conditions for commercial solutions to many of those challenges. So it's an exciting time. I'd like to pivot now to the role of policy in promoting space sustainability. And so, um, Ludwig Weick, may I um, address this following question to you? We heard from Muriel about Luxembourg's prioritization of space sustainability in its national space strategies. Can you discuss how other European nations view the importance of space sustainability in their national strategies and plans. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And uh, thank you for having us in, in this uh, setting and pleased to contribute. But before I get there, because we, we, we just talk about deploying satellites and I, I would like to share the happiness we have on the European side right now because we managed to get Ariane 6 off the ground. Yeah. And, yeah. And uh, the gentleman next to me on my left is uh, the biggest customer these days. And I think uh, this makes an interesting link between access to space and sustainability discussions. In fact, I also like the introduction when you say, let's move from discussion to implementation. I'll try to also emphasize this. I believe also when we talk space policy, it is about getting going and getting into action. I can say as SP, the European Space Policy Institute, we have the privilege and maybe unique situation that our members are largely space agencies. So Luxembourg Space Agency is member since last year, UK Space Agency is member, ESA is a founding member and many others. And we also have industry members. So the idea of public-private partnership is something that is not completely strange to us. And I think to find the solution to many of the questions here, this is a part of the formula and it has been mentioned by you in the introduction, public, private. So what we did on the bigger scale, we do, um, as you may know, reports uh, on various topics, including sustainability. We, we cover the full width of space, but we recently published the Space and Sustainability Momentum Report. And this uh, is a source where you can find a few things that I can touch upon very briefly here. You can see that the importance of sustainability overall has doubled. If you look in just how does it appear in the debate, there is a doubling. You see that uh, it's 13 laws, and I'm not sure whether the number has changed since we last checked, uh, that have been put on uh, in discussion or established in Europe. There was a major effort also on the EU side to establish a law. This is being postponed. We just have a change of the commission. There may be a change of timelines. In fact, there was a discussion from what we understand between sustainability versus competitiveness. Uh, you need to find the right balance. And I think this is uh, part of a delicate operation. Um, and the countries that um, that are issuing these also include Luxembourg, Germany, um, Austria. I'll come back to Austria in a minute. We mentioned just uh, the ESA zero debris we both signed. 
in Berlin recently. Uh, Italy, in fact, they have a specific chapter on active debris removal, so there's also more tangible things. The EU is very clear they want to protect the EU space infrastructure that is financed through the space program. And to come back to Austria, uh, they have in their strategy um, the ambition to establish what they call the Center of Excellence for Space and Sustainability, and in their national strategy, they actually allocated it already to SP. We're neighbors in Vienna. So later this year, we will uh, inaugurate this center. And you talked about synergies and finding platforms and dialogue, and this could be certainly one. Um, we did, as a nice compliment, recently study on the European Parliament elections. We looked at what are really in the uh, politicians' minds, what are the topics when it comes to space. And there are two topics where it really appears. The first one is economy. If, if you do not have an economic dimension in what you do, uh, it is hard on the policy side. The other one that is really complete change of game in Europe is uh, security and defense, probably 10 times increase in terms of importance. Uh, interesting to note that space in itself is not so much a topic. It's more in sectorial support. And what may be interesting also, what was a green and sustainability policy in the larger sense in many governments is also changing in Europe. There's a shift from green and sustainable to security and defense. And you may need to factor this in when you look for policy support. Um, which also brings me to the point that we should probably address the concerns we have in terms of safety and sustainability with the opportunity that comes with it. Make the case that there is a business case attached, there is a case attached to the people that may provide these services, but there's a case attached to the whole space economy that is endangered if you don't fix that problem. And I would um, close by saying is probably also when you use the word sustainability, it's a big word. Um, we talk about sustainability in space. It's probably important to understand for people outside that sustainability also for Earth from space is an element to be put in the narrative. Yeah, absolutely. I completely agree with uh, your, your closing point there. I think we're, we're seeing a much more the disconnection uh, between sustainable development on Earth and space sustainability that, that is uh, rising in salience and being part of more discussions. Um, so, sorry, I've just lost my place here in the, in the questions. So in, in my next um, round of questions, what I'd like to do is to uh, really um, delve a little bit deeper into this tension between access to space and space sustainability. And I'd like to do a, a very fast round of our panelists and ask you in one minute or less, can you characterize for us the top one or two biggest challenges that we face globally in ensuring that efforts to promote space sustainability also support access to space rather than serving as a, an impediment for new actors. What what worries you most? If you can just identify the challenges and time permitting, we'll come back at the end and see if we can also find some possible solutions. So I'll just start from the far end. Okay, uh, thank you for the question. So I would say the major challenge we face is to update global space governance framework to match the rapid emergence of novel space technologies and activities, and also to ensure uh, all countries, not just a few, actually work together to achieve such effective governance. That said, I'm really concerned that now, you know, we are seeing a uh, very deep division uh, among countries. So trust among nations is a foundation to uh, update global space governance, but now, especially after the start of the war in Ukraine, uh, we are seeing deeper division, and such a division, uh, uh, from my viewpoint, uh, is, is reaching the point where uh, it is not easy to repair, so that's my uh, concern. Thank you. Thank you. Hiro? Yeah, I would see two, two concerns or challenges. Um, uh, one being solving while we move forward. Uh, we have a problem with space debris today. Uh, we have companies coming and wanting to move in, rightfully so, uh, and finding solutions um, while we still continue to innovate and uh, let companies come up 
with uh, economic so solutions, but also um, new opportunities. I think that, that that's one element. And then the, the multitude of actors uh, to bring around the table is the other challenge I see. Um, they, I think there's a common interest for all the actors to have a sustainable space in which uh, they can safely launch their, their uh, payloads. Um, but they meet in different fora, have different concerns. Uh, we were mentioning the, the more defense side with the concern on safety, security. Um, so it, it's really different discussions, but with all the same goal. So I think there, there's still hope with the, the challenges to, to move forward. Thank you. Yeah, from an industry perspective, I'd like to provide two examples. The first one is um, a, my, my, our concern is a regulatory framework or uh, legislative regulatory frameworks that are not based on sufficient technical information. It is really important to use the uh, foundation of current space actors, um, space operators that have uh, worked on uh, best practices, industry standards, including ISO, and use those uh, when necessary to implement uh, regulatory requirements. So the lack of um, or the potential of instituting regulatory requirements without the technical foundation. That's my first concern. Um, and my second concern is um, transparency. It is for space sustainability and safe operations. It is critically important to share positional data, covariance, ephemeris, maneuver plans. Um, a lack of transparency would be counter to any safety um, safety operations. And just to, if I may allow a, a, an example, it would be like, uh, the way I imagine is like driving a car at night without your lights on. You, you need to share your data, you, you need to share your maneuverability and uh, maneuver plans. And so, th so those are my two big concerns. Thank you. So that? Yeah, I probably would come back to the public and the private, the biggest thing you need to get is you need the public and the private, the policy and the industry going. You need industry incentive to invest. Industry can be an enormous driver. We just had space tight here three days. Earlier this week, it's a good example where industry actually pulls policy on the table as well. Um, and the strategy fund uh, uh, on the Japanese side is a good example where the public puts up uh, funding because at the end you need the funding. But the incentive for industry and to give them space to really propose solutions, um, then the, the public side probably um, needs to step up on what I call anchor projects. You need projects, you need funding, but at the end you need to get to something that actually is being implemented. You may know or you may not know that Astroscale started and was supported in the early days uh, by ESA Artist Program under Sunrise together with OneWeb. And a typical example where you enable a capability that then uh, creates its own dynamic. So uh, the main thing in summary, get public, private going, create incentives for industry, have policy step up to be an anchor customer. Thank you. And Nagai said, if I could have your thoughts on this yeah. topic. I, I think about the uh, big side uh, space debris, I mentioned that. Uh, in particular, uh, Low Earth orbit has uh, significantly increased uh, in uh, recent year. Uh, this follows the rapid growth in uh, institutional uh, applications and in the commercialization of the space activities, uh, driving by the lower launch cost and uh, high expected return in the data inspected downstream segment. At the same time, uh, space debris is uh, accumulating and uh, may reach uncontrollable level unless uh, effective action is uh, taken uh, because uh, last week a uh, small explosion and make a uh, uh, solid debris that's uh, uh, considering the growth growing importance of the space based in infrastructure for society uh, the sustainable use of uh, us orbit and uh, protection by space based asset will be crucial uh, in the coming de uh, decade Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Um, 
So we've identified the uh, the top challenges, or our panelists have identified them. So now I'd like to delve into the various contexts for those challenges, and I'd like to start with uh, the linkage, linkages of the civil, commercial, and security space that um, you alluded to, which is becoming an important dimension of space sustainability. So Fukushima-san, um, your work crosses a number of uh, important areas of uh, space activity, including the linkages between, as I said, the commercial, civil, and security space. And often these areas are separated nationally and internationally as policy topics, but they're, they're cross-cutting in a sense. Um, so, and, and these are handled by different fora, different agencies. What are your thoughts on this? And uh, is this an effective way to ensure a long-term sustainable environment, or do we need to to make some adaptations? Well, uh, so as you mentioned, so space sectors consist of civil, martial, and national security sectors. And uh, uh, as we know, you know, the linkages among sectors are becoming tighter recent, recently. And one of, one of the reasons uh, is that now, you know, uh, civil and national security sectors are seeking to utilize uh, space innovation in the private sector. So, for example, the U.S. Space Force is now aiming to build a hybrid architecture uh, which integrates uh, commercial space solutions. And also, Japan is actually now uh, supporting the development of commercial space technologies with hydro-use capabilities and also trying to expand uh, its uh, use of commercial services for defense purposes. Uh, on the other hand, uh, so the international governance of military space activities uh, is dealt, dealt, uh, dealt by a different forum from other space sectors. So in the case of uh, rule making of military space activities, you know, uh, the first committee of the UN, UN General Assembly and the, Conf the Conference on Disarmament uh, deal with those issues, and the rest of space activities are dealt by the uh, Post Committee and also uh, UN copious. So I believe, uh, you know, each forum has its own distinctive role and must be respected as such. That said, uh, we need to uh, keep in mind the inter interactions among sectors always. So actually, you know, for example, uh, building, uh, you know, promoting space, re re promoting respo resp responsible space behavior indirectly contributes to the uh, improvement of space su sustainability and vice versa. So I think that uh, such an awareness of interactions among sectors could contribute to uh, further discussions in each forum. Thank you. Thank you. So I'd like to pivot from there to this, the whole notion of a, a sustainable space economy. Where we often hear those words, right? And so I'd like to, to tease out a little bit more what this means in practice. So I'd like to address my next question to Muriel. Um, Luxembourg has focused a large portion of its interest in space activities on developing a sustainable space economy for the future. And your portfolio in the Luxembourg Space Agency focuses on space safety. As space activities become more driven by the private sector, what is the role of space safety in achieving that future space economy? And how do we ensure that space safety practices don't become a barrier to entry for new actors? Yeah, thank you for the question. I think that's uh, it's really interesting to see how what, what can be seen as additional constraint uh, you know, can be also an opportunity. And I think it, it's, there's first of all a role for the agency or, or the countries to set up the right frameworks, uh, be it regulatory or financial, to allow new actors to come in. Uh, this can come in, as I said, through the, the actual uh, legal frameworks, also through uh, incentives, making sure that we have phased approaches for smaller actors, um, and continuing to encourage the, the innovation. Um, that being said, the, the, the space safety uh, and sustainability frameworks aren't only a constraint. I think there are lots of opportunities that come up. Um, 
be it in the new services that are need, uh, whether it's uh, debris remediation, uh, debris removal in orbit servicing. Th these are an incredible number of opportunities. But I think there's another um, change that small companies are actually more flexible and more adjustable to the um, the need for this change. And sometimes it's easier than changing a process in a, in a large company. These the startups and the, the SMEs actually have this this resilience that they can adjust products and move on as they go and really move into these new markets. Uh, so I think that's where it's important as an agency to be there to encourage them and to work on this innovation. Um, there's also the component of talent development, making sure that uh, the workforce is there, is available. Uh, Luxembourg has set up a, a specific space masters to make sure we have this in-house talent in a way. Um, and we actually see that in general, the it, it's uh, it's a great opportunity for new uh, kind of the new space economy that the new talents actually want space sustainability. They're moving away from the kind of say old actors because they they come to companies saying we want to do something for space sustainability or for sustainability in general, and it's really a, a mindset thing. So I think space safety is not just to, series of constraints, it, it, it's a great opportunity and uh, it's necessary, it's a way to move forward, but I think we, we have to take it as it is. Um. Yeah, thank you. Uh, absolutely. And couldn't agree more uh, with you on the remarks about the um, the perspectives of the uh, the younger generation. I think that it's, it's really quite noticeable how cognizant they are of uh, sustainability challenges. And, and I think that, that's, very, that's a very good sign for the future. So, having heard the perspective of uh, of an agency, uh, I'd like now to turn to turn to the uh, private sector perspectives and address my next question to Nagai San. Uh, your company, JSAT, is rooted firmly in the Japanese space industry. How do you approach engagement on space sustainability on the global stage? For instance, how do you interact with other governments or with international space governance bodies such as UN COPUS? Yeah, thank you. Uh, we have been in uh, cooperation with uh, several uh, government agencies in Japan, uh, such as the uh, Minister of uh, International, Internal Affairs and Communications uh, Cabinet and uh, Cabinet Office and uh, Minister of uh, Foreign uh, Affairs for our geo uh, satellite operation. And we have been also promoting the activities of uh, orbital lasers I mentioned before uh, to the uh, government in the US and uh, Asia uh, Japan region. And this, since uh, Setsuko Aoki, uh, who has a great expertise of the space role, Japan, uh, joined to the, our company as board members uh, last year. We would like to continue working uh, productivity uh, regarding our space debris activities. Uh, in cooperation with uh, international space uh, governmental bodies. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So staying with the private sector, but now turning to the topic of large constellations, which in a sense present both space sustainability challenges, but also opportunities to create markets for space sustainability solutions. I would like to address my next question to Yosef. Um, Yes, there have been a lot of growing concerns about the sheer number of satellites planned for launch over the coming years. How does Amazon Kuiper plan on mitigating the impact of its constellation on the orbital environment? Yes, Peter. So like I uh, said earlier, space safety, safe operations, space sustainability is a key component in, in our constellation, uh, is an anchor tenet from, from day one. The way I think about it is in three categories. One is um, how we design, design, operate, and communicate. Those are the three categories. On design is about um, constellation design, selecting orbits. So for example, we're selecting uh, orbits of uh, 590, 610, 630 kilometers with sufficient separation. Uh, and also timely, should something go wrong, should we lose maneuverability for conjunction avoidance, uh, we have timely uh, re-entry to clear out that orbit. 
Uh, we also designing our satellites with uh, backup systems, with shielding of critical systems. So should you be uh, impacted by a non-observable small piece of debris that you have sufficient backup systems. So there's a lot of more things that go into the design component. Um, then the operational component is, uh, of course, all our satellites have maneuverability built in so we can avoid any conjunctions um, and maneuver around other space debris. Um, we're also, um, and the third one is communicate, right? And we're, we're sharing our ephemeris, we're sharing our covariance and maneuver plans with others. And so there's a lot of more, a lot more details to go into these three categories, but those are the real big ones for us. And, um, I think it, it, uh, uh, many, many operational actions can then be derived from those three categories, but that's how we think about it. Good. Thank you. So I'd like now to pivot to the issue of how we take this, um, uh, increased awareness of space sustainability and translate that into action. Um, and I'd like to address the next question to uh, Ludwig. In SP's 2023 report on space safety and sustainability momentum, you identified the challenge of translating political awareness into funding. In other words, that increasing awareness of space sustainability challenges doesn't automatically translate into increased budgets to address those challenges. Um, so uh, can you tell us more about this research and how we might use it to address the space sustainability challenge globally? Yeah, I think the, the question applies to the whole of the space sector. It's not only a question on sustainability. I think we are at the stage where you really need to get space uh, on, on the agenda elsewhere. Uh, but what is interesting in that particular case here is uh, who is funding and when are funding decisions coming if you want to translate into funding. Uh, we've heard the national perspective in Europe. It's about maybe 20% of the funding in public that goes directly through national programs. It depends on the member states. 60% uh, of national funding go intergovernmental through ESA. And we have a ministerial in ESA coming up next year, November. I come to this. And then it's about 20% that are really in the EU space program. So this gives you already an idea where the money sits. That may change over time, but um, this is what it is today. And I don't think it will significantly change. When are the opportunities now if you look at the current EU um, space program, um, the, the topic is in, but it's next to Galileo Copernicus. It didn't have much chance to, to get uh, funding as it should deserve. Uh, so it is on a very low level. And uh, there is an ambition by the next MFF, the next multi-annual framework program, to, to really um, maybe put a flagship up and then you, you get to different funding uh, numbers and uh, we all work towards this and we also advice um, people in, in that direction. Uh, what is interesting, Holger, is in the room here on the ESA side, first row, uh, space safety program, protect, accelerator. Those are real things that are happening now and preparations are happening as we speak, I'm sure. Even today, uh, you have some work in Europe on this. This is shaping and this is really the next opportunity. This happens in a council with member states as delegations from Luxembourg and others. And they really try to make the step. And I think this is the next big step when it comes to public. But it is national, convince national, convince the ESA system uh, and, and work towards the uh, commission side. Then it is true, 85% of the overall money in space is still public money. Um, you see a doubling of the number of companies that go into space safety, which is good. You should leverage them. I do not know whether they could correspond to 15% of the money today. But let's assume this is the order of magnitude. Still, it's a lever. It's a leverage. You need to uh, come back to the public-private. The UN has to really translate it. You need to work also through industry. And I can tell you, also on the ESA side, it is helpful if you have an, an industry case, a business case behind to get the support of delegations, to get the public support uh, that goes with this. It's very pragmatic, and I think uh, the timelines are challenging. And we all know in this room how, how concerned we are with the time we have to fix things before really something is happening. Uh, I would argue the awareness is not, not there yet. Maybe between us and a few others, it's not strong enough yet. But I think um, in the timeline, 25 on either side, 
28 on the commission side. Uh, those are the moments. If we miss them on the European side, then we miss them. Thank you. So, uh, watching the clock here on the stage, I can see we've just got nine minutes left in this um, panel discussion. So, I want to have two uh, really fast rounds with our panelists uh, to try and sort of wrap up this discussion. Um, we won't have time to do the, um, the, the questions via Hoover, but uh, please do submit those and then we will see them. And I'm sure the panelists can uh, also engage with the questions um, afterwards. So, um, very quickly, the first first question, and, and please limit your response to just uh, a minute or so. Earlier on, you identified what you saw as the key uh, one or two challenges that um, you saw coming down the road. What should we be doing to address the challenges you identified? If you could just address within a minute or so each, please. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So, you know, uh, unfortunately, there is no silver bullet to improve trust among nations. But that said, uh, we can continue our discussions uh, such as at, at this summit, you know, to build personal trust among nations. I think that's the only way to go forward. Thank you. Thank you. Meryl? I'd say act, uh, set up, start setting up solutions. Uh, they won't be perfect from the start, but uh, go for it, uh, be, be it, uh, no, the, you know, with servicing missions, uh, SSA solutions, all of them are important and get the prototypes out, get the demonstrations out, uh, start working on them t today. I think that's really the, the way forward. It, it's not by continuing to, well, we have to continue to think and work globally for a global solution, but local um, demonstration missions to start um, and the local local frameworks uh, are going to be the start and then they'll build up from there. Okay. Thank you. Um, emphasize the work that has been done by industry and operators on best practices and standards. I really appreciate the Department of Commerce has recently put out a very extensive list and work with international standards organizations like ISO to build the framework, to build the foundation for um, regulatory requirements as necessary. I think we need absolutely one narrative that is focused on the economic benefit of what is uh, what we are discussing here. Economic benefit for people that will help the sustainability, economic benefit of the space economy as a whole, uh, in space and from space. Um, we need to make a narrative that is very clear in what is at stake. It's not for the purpose of space. It is for the benefit of space for Earth and beyond. And in that narrative, we need to be careful not to have only a bad image that uh, space is dangerous and things can happen. It's an opportunity. And we want to make sure that we can really leverage and develop that opportunity. Let's be positive in the messaging and the narrative to be able to fix the problem that we need to fix. Uh, I, in my opinion, uh, significant importance in their communication, as uh, I mentioned, uh, I... Yeah, we need to uh, communicate to uh, the government, uh, any other operators, and uh, uh, we share uh, all our information, SSA, and uh, I said, uh, so that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I asked you to propose your, your two top solutions. I think some of you gave me your key takeaways as well. Um, anybody else want to come in with, with what one key ta takeaway that you would like to uh, to share with the audience from the session? Fine. Please. So, uh, considering the data linkages among sectors, so I would say the impact of national security sectors' activities or space sust sustainability is a matter, important matter to address. So, as we all know, you know, uh, China's uh, destructive ESA test in 2007 created the largest amount of space debris in history. And also now, you know, uh, the use of nuclear weapons in space uh, has, has come back as an issue. So now, you know, it is in, considering such a situation, it is important uh, to think about how national security sector can operate safely, responsibly, and sustainably uh, in the space domain. And I look forward to the panel discussion 
uh, of space security and, and stability later today. Thank you. Thank you. Here. I take away the, the importance to work with the, the commercial actors to get a sustainable business model uh, to move forward. That's really going to bring it forward. Um, yeah, and to get the narrative right, I, I fully agree on that one. I, I was talking to someone from the press yesterday and they say, what can we do? So get the message out. Tell them how space is important in our everyday lives in a positive way, how we use it. And uh, I, th I think it's really important. As we said, it's a close community. We all know about it. We need to get it out and give this positive image, but together with a message that something needs to be done. Yep. Thank you. I'd like to build on that, actually, and uh, say that space safety and sustainability has to be looked at in a holistic way. Uh, I think that is critically important that we recognize the tremendous benefits that society derives from space, the capabilities that are provided from space, and um, instead of only focusing on the risk, space is, is dangerous and there are risks involved, but also couple that with the benefits of the discussion and the be benefits that, um, you know, without singling out any particular type of operators, but the benefits that uh, you can derive from operating like a large LEO constellation where all the satellites are similar and coordinated um, instead of only focusing on the risks. So I would like to see a more holistic risk and reward and benefit discussion. Thank you. Well, I, I come back to what you said in the introduction. Practical next steps was your second point you wanted. Yeah. Um, and I zoom back to one point I mentioned. The little thing that we can offer from the SB end, and we would uh, invite people to consider as I said, we will start later this year the Center of Excellence for Space and Sustainability in Vienna. It will be a small contribution to a big task, but I think it's an element where we try to coordinate within Europe with our members, uh, but also with the wider community and also internationally. So this is a, a little piece of a practical next step. Thank you. Oh, um, great, great uh, to hear that and certainly look forward to seeing the progress of that initiative. Nagaisan? Yep. Uh, the most significant message of myself is the space is a shared resource in the, for all of us and needs sustainable use and uh, peaceful cooperation. So please make us industry and private company, academia and young professional need to work together uh, to protect the develop the future of space. Thank you. Thank you. And that, that sums it up beautifully. Well, uh, time has caught up with us um, and I'd like to wrap up our panel at this point. So please, uh, thank you to the panelists. Please join me in thanking them. Well, that